The Western Front was a stretch of land weaving through France and Belgium from the Swiss border to the English Channel. To this day, the descendants of those who fought and died in the area are still unearthing unidentified bodies and unexploded ordnance. A Flanders battlefield tour is one way to gain an appreciation for what happened in just a tiny portion, tiny portion of the front, the area around Ypres, Belgium. It also has lessons to teach us about what happens to cities and land, infrastructure and people during a siege. The damage done here to the people, homes, public works, infrastructure, and even the land remains unimaginable to this day. Let's chat about it. Hello, and welcome back to the Armchair Traveler. My name is Judy. I love to travel. I do this on my own, and so can you. I'm here to teach you how. The First Battle of Ypres marked the climax of the Race to the Sea, an attempt by the German army to break through Allied lines and capture French ports on the English Channel, which opened to the North Sea and beyond. Neither side was able to best the other. Active advances slowed or stopped in late 1914, so the soldiers dug in on each side and built trenches. This rather attractive pastoral shot really does not convey the horror of this fighting. The trenches provided protection from bullets and shells, but they carried their own risks. Trench foot, trench fever, dysentery and cholera could and did inflict casualties as readily as any enemy gun. Poison gas could infiltrate as easily as the rain, and rats, flies, and lice were also commonplace. This trench of death is located just northwest of Ypres and is where the Belgian and German forces confronted each other for nearly four years. The trenches are original, although they have been strengthened some, and the sandbags that were there originally have been replaced with cement blocks to make them last. Other soldiers, weapons, disease, and life pests are by no means a soldier's only enemies. Boredom is another. But the worst, the most miserable, must be mud. It sticks to everything from your boots and clothes to faces and all your equipment. It's basically impossible to get off or to get clean short of hosing yourself down, and then you're still going to be wet. Hoses didn't exist in trenches. This battlefield photograph shows mud turning a road into a quagmire. Notice the abandoned artillery on the side of the road and the horses, which did all the heavy lifting, in the far distance. Now imagine that mud in a trench where men were jammed together for days on end with no way to get dry or clean. This picture was taken during World War I by a noted Australian photographer named Frank Hurley. Fans of history or polar exploration might recognize the name. Hurley had been the official photographer of Sir Ernest Shackleton's doomed endurance expedition. After he returned from that expedition, he signed up with the Australian Army and became an official war photographer. This photo shows an extremely wet, muddy trench. In the background, I can see a soldier sheltering from the rain just outside what might be the entrance to a dugout. There are sandbags piled up on the walls of the trench to prevent collapse. Spades and other implements are strewn across the foreground, and there's even a roll of barbed wire behind the burnt and blasted remains of a tree. This photograph was also taken by Frank Hurley and shows Australian infantry in a trench, all wearing respirator masks. He must have been standing in the trench to take the picture, so he must have been wearing a mask as well. Locating a gravesite and connecting it with a name wasn't easy even during the war, when the memory was fresh in men's minds and became immensely more complicated after the war. Battle lines and grave sites shifted throughout the four years of the Battle of Flanders. The ground was chewed up by passing infantry from both sides, as well as artillery, horses, and explosions from mines. This shows a grave outlined by a few sticks in a muddy puddle. I can't tell from this photograph whether the grave is wet because of groundwater or rainwater. The fact is that within a few months, every identifying marker on this poor soldier would have disappeared. A simple cross bears the date 25 November 1916 and the inscription, RIP, unknown British soldier, found here. I took this photo the day of my tour. The guide explained that farmers and road builders come across the remains of mines, some of them still operational, and other ordnance fairly frequently to this day. In Belgium, munitions and wartime iron harvested by farmers are carefully placed around the edges of the fields or in gaps between telephone poles, where they are regularly collected by the Belgian army for disposal in a controlled explosion center at Pole Capelle. Shells containing poisonous gas remain viable and will corrode and release their gas content. 
Close to 5% of the shells fired during the First World War contained poisonous gas, and ordnance disposal experts continue to suffer burns from mustard gas that it spits off. The depot was built after ocean dumping of shells was finally stopped in 1980. Once extracted by the Army, any gas chemicals are burned and destroyed at high temperatures at, at specialized facilities and the explosives detonated. Over a century later, this is still an extremely dangerous job. Pole Capel British Cemetery is still the third largest in Flanders. There are nearly 7,500 soldiers buried here, 85% of whom are unidentified, and whose headstones bear the inscription, Known Unto God. Here in Pol Capel, you'll encounter yet another Cross of Sacrifice memorial. These Commonwealth War Memorials were designed in 1918 by Sir Reginald Blomfield for the Imperial War Graves Commission, which is now called the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. You find them in any Commonwealth War Cemetery containing 40 or more graves. Although not his country's top flying ace, Georges Guinemer became France's most popular and beloved ace of the First World War. He flew 600 missions and is credited with shooting down 53 German planes as well as three observational balloons. He was killed during the Battle of Passchendaele in 1917. He took off on a mission and never returned. There were reports that he was shot down or possibly his airplane simply failed near Pole Capel. Whether his body was ever found even remains disputed to this day. There were reports at the time that the German forces had found him but had to abandon the body during the battle. The figure at the top of this column is a stork, a symbol of rebirth, or possibly carrying the aviator back home. Langemark is the second largest of the four German cemeteries in the area, with 44,000 burials. The sign on the right reads, The homeland commemorates the fallen of the war who are resting in Langemark. This is a German-only cemetery, but the Belgians who tend these memorials and cemeteries honor Allied and German power combatants equally well. This is a view of a memorial in just one of the areas of the huge Langemark Cemetery. On the left are statues of soldiers, some carrying helmets. On the right is a memorial wreath. None of the bodies here have been identified, and I suspect it isn't at all certain they were all even German. The inscription in the wreath is from Isaiah. The full verse reads, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. So many people perished in this general area that sometimes individual memorials weren't possible. This one honors the fallen by date of death. I think the word nactrag means supplemental, or dead for whom they have names but cannot associate specific bodies. These three markers lack names, dates, or any other sort of identification at all. The Hill 62 Canadian Memorial commemorates the defense of Ypres by Canadian troops in 1916. Over 8,000 Canadian soldiers died during this part of the battle to prevent Canadian forces from occupying the little bit of Belgium that was still controlled by the Allies. The brooding soldier at Vancouver Centre, shown in these photographs, is a memorial specifically to 2,000 Canadian soldiers who died during or shortly after the first gas attacks by the Germans in 1915. This is the memorial plaque at the base of the brooding Canadian soldier. It reads, This column marks the battlefield where 18,000 Canadians on the British left withstood the first German gas attacks, the 22nd through the 24th of April, 1915. 2,000 fell and lie buried nearby. Tynecott Battleground sits on a very slight ridge. This photo shows some of the farmland just beyond a remaining German blockhouse, which I've marked with an arrow. You can see how flat the land was here, meaning that even the ability to climb on top of a blockhouse might have given one of the opposing lines a tactical edge. A higher tree would have been better, but by the end of the war there were no trees here. This is still the largest Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery in the world. Nearly 12,000 Commonwealth Great War Service dead, 8,300 of whom were never identified, are interred here. Another 35,000 are commemorated in the memorial wall men who died but whose bodies have never been found. German forces had built four heavily reinforced concrete blockhouses here, one of which was large enough to be used as an advanced dressing station. These would have been taller at the time, hollow, with loopholes and at least one heavily fortified entryway. The cemetery was designed to incorporate the pillboxes, placing a cross of sacrifice on the largest, known as the Tyne Cot Blockhouse. That blockhouse had been large enough to serve as a dressing station for German wounded. The remains of this concrete blockhouse are just a relic. The tree next to it probably didn't start growing until sometime in the 1920s. 
This impressive memorial wall lists some 35,000 British Commonwealth service members known to have died in the area, but whose body was never recovered, or if it was, could not be identified. There are others, bodies which have been recovered and interred, but whose names aren't known. They lie under headstones bearing the inscription, Known to God. This is another view of that memorial wall. One important thing I saw in every Great War cemetery, whether Commonwealth or German, was how well cared for the landscape and grounds were. This cemetery, given its size and importance in the battle, must have been heavily visited. And yet, making allowances for the season, which was the end of summer, the grounds were in excellent condition, with flowers everywhere. The memorial register lists the names and locations of all the known burials here at the cemetery. People come here and can look up their relative or family member and then find the grave. Because of the long period of time that this battle continued, even though it had settled down into trench warfare, mines and artillery, movement of men, horses, and material, and the destruction of all the landmarks meant that thousands of recovered bodies were never identified. When an unidentified body was found, it was moved here and a grave marker with an inscription reading, A Soldier of the Great War, was put on the top, along with a notation, Known unto God, at the bottom. This was in part because some of these soldiers undoubtedly were Germans. The standard design for a cross of sacrifice calls for it to be placed on top of an octagonal platform, as it does here. What is far less usual is the placement of the platform. In this case, it was built over the side of a German pillbox. The site of Polygon Wood is now a peaceful farmed field at the Butte's New British Cemetery and New Zealand Memorial. Beyond the hedgerow is the former battleground of memorials. The small photo on the right was taken by Frank Hurley and shows Australian infantrymen wearing gas mask protection. Butte's New British Cemetery is what is referred to as a concentration site, created after the war when the Graves Commission Unit discovered and recovered more than 2,100 isolated graves and unburied remains in the local battlefields. 1,700 of these were never identified. The photo above shows what it looked like when it was first built. You can see the memorial tower in the top center of the photograph. Sometimes a painting will give you a better feeling for a landscape than does a photograph. This painting was done by George Edmund Butler, and it is of the battlefield in Polygon Wood, painted in 1918. The butte, or hill, is clearly visible in the background, as are the stumps of all the trees for which this small wood was actually named. Four years of fighting reduced Polygon Wood to a desert of splintered stumps, churned earth, battlefield debris, and thousands of battlefield graves with crosses, and just under the surface the remains of many more who died in the mud. This is the Polygon Wood Cross of Sacrifice. A common feature to these memorials is a stylized bronze longsword pointed down. The cross is designed so that a second bronze sword could be fastened to the rear as well. The sword is positioned so that the cross guard on the sword matches where the cross's shaft and cross arm meet. This shows two views of the Buttes Memorial to the Australians who fought at Polygon Wood. The wood was the scene of bitter fighting and exchanged hands several times between British and German armies during the four years of the war. In the late summer of 1917, during the last weeks of the Third Battle of Ypres, it was captured from the Germans by the 5th Australian Division in fierce fighting. The following spring, in April of 1918, the British Army made the difficult decision to leave Polygon Wood and pull back its front line as a result of the German Army launching a spring offensive. Several months later, shortly before the end of the war, the wood was finally retaken by the 9th Scottish Division of British Army. This cemetery contains the remains of over 2,100 servicemen from the Commonwealth. Of these burials, only 396 were identified for a known grave and headstone. This part of Flanders draws a great many visitors from Australia and New Zealand. One of the local innkeepers has a Great War themed restaurant and museum, which is a real landmark in the area. As you can see from the painting on the front facing, he dedicated his establishment to the Anzacs, Australians and New Zealanders, who fought here in the Battle of Polygon Wood. The man who owns the restaurant, which he calls the Anzac Restaurant, is an amateur local historian and brewer as well. Johan de Rewe, has a passion for the stories of the people that fought just over the road in Polygon Wood and has some experience as a battlefield archaeologist. He also has a mission.
In 2006, a local road builder was laying a new gas pipeline near here. He uncovered human remains, stopped digging, and called his friend Johan, who could confirm that the remains had to be from World War I. Johan called the local police and the mayor, and eventually they put together a team and began carefully excavating the area. After clearing the first grave, they found a second, then a third, fourth, and fifth. The soldiers' remains had not been thrown into a grave as had been the other four. Someone had wrapped the body in a sheet and took great care in burying it. It turned out the dead soldier was named John Hunter, who went by the name of Jack. In 1917, Private Jack Hunter died in his brother Jim's arms and was buried where he fell, in the mud at Passchendaele. The burial was meant to be temporary, but the ground changed hands several times until the end of the war and all the existing landmarks disappeared. After the war, Jim returned and searched for his brother for years, but was never able to find him. Jack remained one of the missing, a man known to have died in the area, but whose body had never been recovered or identified. His name was carved and stayed in the Menin Gate Memorial near Ypres. Research led to the family in Australia, who confirmed that the story in the family was that he had been buried by his younger brother, Jim. DNA testing on a great nephew finally confirmed the identity completely. It was never meant to be this way. Jack Hack hadn't even wanted to come to the war, but Jim had enlisted. Jack wouldn't leave his younger brother to fight in a strange land alone, so he enlisted too. He promised their father he'd look after his little brother and that they would both return home safe. Jim made it home, married, lived a long life, but never forgot his promise. When he was dying of heart failure in 1967, family members heard him calling out, Where is Jack? Where is Jack? This story is the basis for the Brothers in Arms War Memorial. The painting here is a prototype for a small bronze casting. The restaurateur collected gifts and donations from visitors for nearly 15 years to cast the full-size statue, which was finally unveiled in late 2022. The innkeeper does more than just serve lunch and solicit funds for his project. He runs a microbrewery. There are 400 breweries in Belgium now, and I made an attempt to taste all the beer that was put in front of me. The food is pub grub, and the beer was excellent. Johan also solicits donations in part by selling small lapel pins featuring an image of the proposed memorial. This was a small casting that I saw inside the pub, a prototype for the final memorial. The full-size casting and the memorial grounds were unveiled in October of 2022. A look at this battle map from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission of the Eber Salient helps explain why there were so many unidentified soldiers from each side of the war. A salient is simply a bulge in a line that gives the defenders the advantage of being able to fire on those inside the salient from three sides. In this case, Ypres was on the inside, the Germans were on the outside, and they had the additional advantage that most of their trenches and defensive lines were on the higher ground overlooking the wet lowlands held by the British. Your starting point and the target of the German army was Ypres, which I've circled in blue. The distance between the line closestest and furthest to Ypres is mostly less than five miles wide. In 1914, the fast movement of the war had stopped and each side entrenched along a line running near Polygon Wood, which I've marked in brown. In May 1915, the Germans launched a counterattack with gaffs and pushed westward through St. Julian to a line through Huga, which I've marked in red. The line barely moved after that for the next two years. In the spring of 1917, the Allies once more took the offensive. This was the third battle of Ypres called Passchendaele, and it took place in the wettest autumn weather Flanders had recorded in nearly three quarters of a century. By early November, the Allies had pushed eastward to a line running through Passchendaele, which had been completely destroyed. I've marked that line in green on the map. In the spring of 1918, the Germans made one last attempt, reclaiming all the ground the Allies had won the autumn before, pushing the salient back practically to the gates of Ypres itself. Here the line stabilized brief briefly, but in the autumn, the Allies retook the offensive and through August and September, swept past all of the old battlefields to a line that is beyond this map. When you consider the small amount of ground, the numerous changings of ownership, the large numbers of fights, the immense amounts of artillery and mines deployed, it becomes obvious how, in an age before the ability to medevac wounded soldiers to safety, so many who were injured and died had to be buried where they fell.
This is the village of Huga, which is only about two miles east of Ypres. This view of Huga was taken from a slight rise in the ground to the southwest. The photo shows that rise compared to the cemetery and the new town, and it's probably less than 15 feet or so. In these flat lands, that would have been almost like a mountain. It would have made shooting artillery against the defenders easier and trying to oust the Germans much harder because the soldiers would be rushing uphill. Hugo was directly on the 1915 battlefront line and remained there for a very long time. The town was completely destroyed by the intense fighting that occurred. The land, by this time the village no longer existed, was taken and retaken several times. Each side exploded mines beneath the front line trenches there. The most visible evidence remaining today is a large pond near a hotel and restaurant at a nearby theme park, whose owner landscaped three mine craters blown by the German units in June 1916 as part of their offensive against Canadian troops into an existing pond. A restaurant called the Canadian Tea Room overlooks the pond. On July 30, 1915, Huga was also the site of the first use of flamethrowers, liquid fire as it was referred to at the time, employed by the Germans against British positions. The Huga Crater Museum has recreated small sections of trenches for visitors to experience. I was lucky enough to be there on a dry day. I've been told by an expert that these small chunks of recreated history actually managed to sanitize and clean up some of the horror. Whether British or German, trench life was a nightmare. When Germany kicked off World War I, it pushed very rapidly through Belgium and into France. The offensive stopped at the First Battle of the Marne. The Germans retreated back into northern France along with a sliver of Belgium in order to regroup. Each side tried to outflank the other in Flanders in what is called the Race to the Sea, in which the goal was to find an open flank on which to resume mobile operations with the intent of bringing the war to a quick conclusion. From late September through mid-November 1914, however, neither side was able to reach open territory in advance of the other. The First Battle of Ypres marked the end of that attempt. The war settled down into static trench warfare. Winter was coming. Each side dug in, reinforced their creations, and put up barbed wire entanglements to protect themselves. The distance between the two trenches became a no-man's land and a killing field. The nightmare also came from water. Each side had to deal with the water, which flowed into the trenches not just from above, but from below. Germans had a slightly easier time because their trenches tended to be on slightly higher ground. Since the trenches were excavated, groundwater leaching upwards was always going to be a problem. On the left you see a British trench, identifiable because of the corrugated metal sides and the poles holding up the walls. On the right is a German trench walkway, identifiable by the lathe used to shore up the walls. Each side put in benches which doubled as parapets to look out over the top of the trench. Being inside a trench, however, was no guarantee of safety. During the Great War, 75,000 men in the British forces became casualties because of trench foot. These photographs show two sections of reconstructed trench complete with sandbags. Originally, this entire area would have been roofed over with corrugated metal, as you can see in the photo on the right. Note the duckboard walkways in each. Although designed to keep the soldiers' boots out of the mud, this entire low-lying area has a high water table. Rainwater would have made its way in from top, as well as runoff from the higher ground, and groundwater would have been leaching upward. The area between the trenches, the so-called no-man's land, was filled with shell and mine craters, each of which also would have flooded, along with many dead bodies. The stench of the rotting bodies and the contaminated rainwater from these shell holes would also have made their way into the trenches. Anyone who grew up on a farm, as I did, can tell you that barbed wire is mean stuff. It will discourage the most ornery steer and will tear a hole right through a human's denim trousers and into her hide. I know because 60 plus years later I can still find the scars. In this battle, barbed wire wasn't just left on the ground the way we think of concertina wire. It was strung up the same way it would have been on a farm, attached to poles or stakes in the ground. The poles didn't have to be very high, just two or three feet above the ground would snag the attackers, or at least slow them down, but they did have to be dug in, probably at least a foot. Early on, each side used wooden pickets or posts, but these had to be dug into the ground. This was a long process at night, when the odds are your opponent might see you and shoot you. The alternative was faster, pounding the pickets into the ground, but that made an infernal racket, giving away not just what you were doing, but where. The solution came in 1916, with the appearance of steel pickets, sometimes called corkscrew pickets. 
These could be screwed into, screwed into the ground silently. The sign near this exhibit explained that German and British pickets were initially produced in the same factory before the war, which is why they looked so much alike. Each had a kind of screw on the bottom that could be twisted more or less silently into the ground. No pounding was required. Each had loops through which the soldiers could thread the wire, but there was a tiny difference at the top. British pickets like this one ended with a circle on the top. This shows a German-style picket, except for the very top. They look identical to the British pickets, mostly because there aren't a lot of alternative design options. The, the difference is the top of the picket here ended with a spike, whereas the British pickets ended with a loop for more barbed wire. I'm not sure which was more dangerous, being topped with another layer of barbed wire or coming up against a spike, but I am sure that coming up against that barbed wire was going to be extremely unpleasant. The area in and around Hill 60 is just a few miles south of Ypres and along a main rail line which is still in operation to this day. It was the site of fierce fighting over several years during the Great War. There were actually two elevations, one which is now called Hill 60, it used to be something like Lover's Hill to the north, and the Caterpillar to the south. Railway builders excavated rock and dirt from the railway cut on each side of the line and piled up the dirt, creating the mounds. In such flat territory, even a 60-foot high hillock was worth getting and retaining strategically. Control of the area swapped several times during the war. The image on the left from Google Earth and the map show the same general orientation. You can see the train tracks leading to Ypres off to the top left corner in each. The red line marked Berlin Tunnel on the map refers to the British Miners Tunnel from behind their lines to areas under both Hill 60 and the Caterpillar. The lines were relatively close together. The black arrow shows the British line closer to Ypres. The blue arrow shows the German line and their control of both Hill 60 and the Caterpillar. Starting in early 1915, each side began trying to undermine the other's lines. The British succeeded in tunneling under the lines and managed to blow up several mines. There was then considerable above-ground fighting and the British managed to capture the area but were unable to hold it. The Germans retained possession of the area until 1917, when two of the mines were detonated, one under Hill 60 and the Caterpillar. When the mines detonated, explosives went off, demolishing a large part of Hill 160 and blowing a hole in the former Caterpillar that is visible from space to this day. This is a view of the Caterpillar Crater on the day I visited. Our guide walked all the way into the depression, which was mostly dry. He told us that most years there are a couple of feet of water in the bottom. This was an exceptionally dry year. This image was taken during more normal weather and gives you an idea of how big that crater must have been. The man in the foreground gives you some perspective. The water only fills the bottom part of the crater. I've marked the embankment height with a white arrow. Assuming the man is around 6 feet tall, there's another 18 feet or so of crater above the water line, and I have no idea how much more there is underneath. This monument remembers the officers and men of the first Australian tunneling company who died in the mining and defense operations on Hill 60. Notice the plaque. Those are bullet holes dating from World War II. After the war, a British family bought the site and left it untouched. As a result, the Caterpillar Crater that you saw earlier and Hill 60 are among the best preserved landscapes in the area. Pillboxes were generally made out of reinforced concrete. There was an opening so men could climb in and opening so they could point their weapons out in all directions. You can still see the markings left from when the concrete was poured. My guess would be they used wood to make the mold. On the right is a view of the reinforcing bars, or rebar. It's over a hundred years later, and that stuff is still intact. This is the exterior view of the huge Menin Gate in Ypres, which honors deceased soldiers for whom authorities know the names, but whose bodies have never been recovered. Building this memorial was part of the early efforts to rebuild the destroyed city and took close to eight years. The Men and Gate Memorial now bears the names of more than 54,000 officers and men whose graves are not known. If you'd like to know more about it or to visit Ypres, check out my video blog on the Ypres City Walk. It's here on YouTube. The Second Battle of Ypres was fought during the First World War from April 22nd through May 25th, 1915. This was the first major battle fought by Canadian troops in the Great War. During the battle, a basic medical station for casualties was set up in dugouts cut into the western flank of the Ypres-Iser Canal, which is near here. 
Early on April 23rd, a few hours after the surprise German gas attack, the 1st Canadian Field Artillery Brigade took up a position on the west bank of the canal. Major John McRae was with them. McRae was second in command of the brigade, but he was also a doctor intended to the wounded. This photo shows the fortified dugouts which served as medical treatment stations. The signboard you see in the background of this photo suggests that this is where McRae wrote his famous poem, In Flanders Field. He did that after he buried a friend, Lieutenant Alexis Helmer, on May 3rd. Like so many others, Helmer's grave has been subsequently lost. A farm near this station was listed as Essex Farm on the British Army battlefield maps, which is how the area and later this cemetery got its name. This is a relatively small cemetery. There are about 1,200 dead commemorated, of whom 104 remain unidentified. This shows the burial memorial for Valentin Joseph Strudnik. Joe, as he was called, was not quite 16 when he died near here. He was 14 when he enlisted and had lied about his age. He got six weeks of training before being shipped across the channel and only survived five months in combat. He died quite close to here on January 14, 1916. I read a report of the boy's death from his local newspaper which didn't mention how it was that a 14-year-old child came to be serving. Perhaps they didn't check very carefully. Maybe they believed his lies. It does use his memory to shame rather reluctant older men into signing up for the war. The two photographs on the right are views of the interior of those reinforced dugouts that served as dressing stations and surgical suites at Essex Farms. This wraps up my Flanders battlefield tour. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something about it. If you're curious about the city of Ypres, you can watch my video blog, Ypres City Walk. Ypres remembers its war dead with a last post every day of the year. Check out my video blog, Ypres Last Call. Finally, if you're curious about why I, an independent traveler, decided on a guided tour, keep watching. Most of the time, I tour independently, but occasionally, especially if doing so would require me to drive, it makes sense to sign up and let someone else handle it. The sites I visited here were reasonably close to one another, but not connected by public transportation. I did a lot of research before I settled on this particular vendor, operated by a Belgian-Australian couple. The company doesn't appear on the major tour booking sites. I found out about them by reading Rick Steves' book and the online comments. I traveled with the husband, Philippe, who was obviously knowledgeable not just about history and things anybody could read in a history book, but about military history and the terrain and conditions that existed at the time. I don't get paid to promote anyone on this site. I've been traveling for 50 years and have done a few tours. Military history isn't a particular interest of mine, but it is of my husband. I took this tour mostly so I'd have someone competent to explain it, I do take good notes, and tell me where to point my camera. Philippe did both superbly. Thank you for joining me today. If you think this video is interesting or helpful, please give it a like, share, and subscribe to my channel. It's free to you, but it will help the channel grow. Travel sites and history can be fairly wordy, especially background information, so some of my YouTube video blogs will have companion pieces with more information. There are also pieces which don't make it into video format at all. You can read them on my WordPress blog site. The address is armchairtraveler2022.wordpress.com. If you'd like to keep up when I post new blogs or video blogs, or are interested in short posts, follow me on Twitter, where my handle is at armchair2022. I'll be tweeting updates for new posts, and when I begin traveling again, we'll take you along virtually on Twitter.